Troy Hunt, have I been porn creator? Thanks for joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly. G'day. Thank you for having me. Uh, Troy, look, a big fan, and uh, you've got a lot of followers in the industry, so it's really uh, interesting to where we're going to start. Uh, this is part of Cyber West. Tickets went on sale yesterday, so you're going to be hopefully heading over to WA. I hope it's not a virtual session, but this is the Cyber West Summit 2023 in May. Um, maybe just a, for those of the audience who may not have heard of you, uh, they've been hiding under a rock, but what do you do day to day? Have I been pawned and you run your um, your own your own blog and YouTube channel as well? It's all a bit of a blur, but uh, but first of all, yes, I am going to be there in person. I've booked the flights, right. okay. <laughs> so I'm going to be in Perth. Uh, if I'm completely honest, like I just get up each day and I, I look at my inbox and I decide what makes sense. But uh, look, a bunch of it is is have I been pwned, whether it's the data breaches or we're doing a, a lot of work around um, things like the pwned passwords feature at the moment where you can you know, search to see if a password's been breached before. So that's that's used about three billion times a month at the moment. So we're pretty happy yeah. with that. Um, if only I made money out of that, I would have been really well, good. <laughs> you, well, I'll give you a plug. You are open for donations as well. <laughs> How, how do you manage that site? Do you have people managing their site or are you managing that site yourself? Uh, have I been pwned in general or pwned passwords? Uh, have I been pwned? I've been calling it pwned all these years, but anyway. Well, I own that domain as well just in case because it's an easy mistake. Um, <laughs> so so for, for many, many years it was it was just myself uh, and then my, my wife has been very, very helpful over the last couple of years as well. She's gotten very involved. So uh, she is now the COO of all things <laughs> Troy, right. which is good, including Have I Been Pwned. Uh, we do have some some community contributions around the open source bits of Pwned passwords. So a mate of mine, Stefan in Iceland, whose last name I can't pronounce, something Icelandic, <laughs> but he does, a, he does a bunch of work on that as well, on the open source bits. So for the most part, it's, it's pretty much been running it uh, as, as a bit of a skeleton staff. And yeah. Look, I mean, that, that's one of the things we've got to look at in the future because we've got to have a little bit of a contingency plan for my eventual demise one way or the other, right? Yeah. But, I mean, it, it's amazing the amount of breaches. Uh, again, I follow you on Twitter as well and how you're sort of always at the, the forefront of that. The latest one is uh, Eye for Fraud oh, nice. uh, over the, the last couple of days. Um, yeah, just with your experience in the industry, what's your general observations on the amount of, and the continuation of breaches and they continue to get larger, right, given some of the larger ones last year. Uh, are we ever going to get there, do you think? What's what's your general observation of the industry at the moment? I think it depends on how you define there. Uh, you know, often <laughs> yeah, people are like, they ask the question, are we, are we winning the war? You know, are we winning yeah. the cyber war against the hackers and everything? And I, I kind of liken it to asking if you're winning the war against your fingernails. It's like I keep cutting them and they keep growing back. Like, yeah. Yeah. When am I going to win this war? Well, you, you, you don't, right? It's, it's, it's a maintaining of, of equilibrium. I think that the interesting thing with data breaches is if we think about, you know, what, what are the factors that amplify the, the prevalence and, and the scale of them? Well, they're, they're things like having more systems online, having more people, uh, collecting more data, having more interoperability, making it easier and faster and cheaper to get services online. There's so many data breaches in there that are just like exposed as three buckets, for example, or, or there was a period there where all, all the Mongos were left out there without passwords. So we've got all these these factors just amplifying the risk. And I, I think when we look at it through that lens, it's like, well, it's not surprising that we are where we are. And there's really nothing that's that's stemming the tide of breaches. Do you think the passwordless uh, approach is probably best practice at the moment, for particularly from a corporate enterprise perspective? De depending on how we define it, because very often I'm seeing people define passwordless as uh, come to this website, put in your email address or your phone number, and then we'll send you an SMS <laughs> or an email. And then you wait till that comes in, and then you get the code. And I, I hate that with a passion for so many reasons. But if we then talk about the passwordless approach in terms of things like security keys, it's like, look, from a security perspective, love it. Bit of a barrier to entry to get people over there. If you're in the enterprise, you basically own your staff anyway. You own all the people who own the logins. You can tell them, you know, carry your security key array and uh, not a problem. My mum and dad using it as a means of authenticating to different services. Yeah, that's a little bit more of a more, yeah. more of a hard sell. I think things like pass keys are getting getting good traction now. I certainly use them on a bunch of services. So we're getting other other mechanisms of authentication, but clearly we haven't just gone. Yep, here's the fix, and we're all good. What are, what type of approach do you take forensically on breaches? Are you doing any forensic analysis of breaches? 
uh, you write your own blog and the like. But yeah, what what type of approach do you take forensically when you look at a breach? Well, the analysis for me is is normally trying to first of all establish the legitimacy. So, I mean, you mentioned I for fraud before. That was a perfect example. Yeah. So, recent one, sixteen million unique email addresses. So this data pops up. Some some rando on the internet, no disrespect to randos, but it's, it's usually someone I don't know pops up and they're like, hey, here's all the data. It's real. It's like, oh, okay, thank you, rando. Let me just go and individually or independently verify that. So it's, it's often very simple things like that particular breach had a combination of accounts for that service and then transactions which had been recorded when people place an order because they're there to try and stop fraud. So you go to some yeah, T-shirt website. Uh, was one of the ones I looked at for someone. And you buy your T-shirt, and then in the background, the T-shirt shop is taking your data, sending it to I for fraud, and I for fraud is making sure it's legitimate. So uh, in, in that case where we had both these, these users who were like second-degree customers, so customers of I for fraud's customers, but then we had this other group, which was the customers of the service. For those ones, it's really easy to uh, go to the password reset page, put in an email address, and there's usually enumeration vectors. So in the case of I for fraud, it's like, okay, fat finger and email address, this account doesn't exist. Literally copy and paste out of the data breach into password reset. Thank you. We sent you a reset email. So, well, what are the chances if every random email address I pick out of that user table actually exists on the service? Well, it's probably going to be legitimate. So, you know, that, that among many other techniques is usually the, the, the forensics form of a better term that are done, just establishing legitimacy. I suppose that's a question. Uh, how do, how would you define you yourself? What do you do? Because uh, you must get a lot of nomination, uh, sort of uh, notifications to say, "Hey, spotted this and the like." Uh, and you're definitely seen globally as an industry leader. How do you define what you do? It's almost a sort of technology journalist as well, in a way, uh, but very specialised. Look, I think it depends on on the audience. If it's, I end up just due to the nature of infosec doing a lot of consumer facing media stuff and normally it's like security researcher so all right, well, that's yeah <laughs> fine okay that, that'll do uh yeah i have some microsoft titles so sometimes if it's the right audience it'll be like okay microsoft regional director and we don't need to then get in the weeds about what that means but um I, look I, I think as as far as i'm concerned with people sending me data probably more than what sort of title or definition they put on it they know i run this this massive search service they know that I, I seem to be doing the right thing and people yep. seem to be happy with it and I, I think you know in a way the reputation sort of precedes you and and people understand me for, for who I am well look some of the numbers are amazing have you surprised yourself sort of when you look back and where you started and where the site currently is uh yeah you think knife of fraud 16 million that's uh, the top of the most recently added breaches. Mm. But the largest is there, the uh, collection number one accounts, 772, yeah. nearly 800,000, 800 million, sorry. Uh, yeah, what's when you look back and where you're currently at and some of the numbers, surprised? I, you know, I, th I think the thing that surprised me the most out of all these numbers is the one that's not on there, which is that this has almost been running for a decade. <laughs> like it'll be a decade in December, yeah. which is crazy because... I didn't think that it was ever going to do anything of significance. That's why I gave it such a stupid name. <laughs> you know, like that. And <laughs> you just can't buy a domain name that matches any sort of logical name these days, not if you want the .com TLD. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm surprised it's run for that long. And then I guess looking back on it, that I've been able to run it so long independently. I am surprised that I've never had any major dramas with either an individual or an organisation getting too upset and making my life difficult. I think that's probably a combination of good luck and good management, if I'm honest. Uh, and look, I guess in terms of the the, the total number of, of breaches and records and so on, I almost feel that that's just been the constant throughout the years, right? It's just been, yep. on average, it's about every four days a data breach is added into Have I Been Pwned? And that, that trend has just continued. And obviously, we've seen some that are more significant than others. I mean... The, there's the the oldies like Ashley Madison and LinkedIn and Dropbox, which will always be sort of uh, sort of the big ticket items in terms of impact. But then we just see an endless stream of new things. Uh, one of the, I, I really want to do this talk. It's going to be like the not safe for work talk, and it's going to be about the weirdest data breaches I've seen because I am surprised by the nature <laughs> of some of the breaches. And if people want to have a look at this, just go to who's been pwned. And maybe just go through and look for the ones that are flagged as sensitive because there's some really, really weird stuff out there. Uh, is this something you're going to be talking in Cyber West uh, for? 
Maybe, maybe. Some of it's a bit edgy. I've got to, got to be careful because I seem to get into trouble a lot, not because of data breaches and so on, but because I'll say one thing that someone's unhappy about and then they make a complaint and then it's got to come to me. So I'm really, really cautious now about talking about anything, particularly if it deals with like an adult nature, which a bunch of them are, or things that are a little bit uh, a little bit on the edgier side. Uh, I, I think maybe, I think it's safer to do it in Australia than other parts of the world. So maybe Fair I'll have enough. some of it in Cyber West. Um, one, one of the things I've noticed, you are starting to do some partnerships. What are your sort of key partners on the site as well? Uh, say, is it other governments as well? Uh, law enforcement? Yeah, what, where were some of your key partners? Yeah, look, different partnerships with different natures. Uh, probably the obvious one is there's one password on, on the front of Have I Been Pwned? So I was a, independently a one password user for, for many, many years by my own free volition. And then then we were sort of chatting one day and went, oh, this would, this would make sense. When someone finds themselves breached and we just say, go and change your password, good luck. It's like, well, go and change your password with a good yeah. password manager and then don't make it a password anymore. You know, like, go and make it more unique and all the stuff we know they should do. So that's been there for quite a while. Uh, there's about three dozen different governments using the service at the moment to monitor uh, their, their, let's say in the case of Australia, their, their .gov.au TLD and everything that, that comes off that. So, so that's a great one. And that's just a, a free service for governments because a lot of them are monitoring a heap of domains on Have I Been Pwned anyway. So it's kind of a way of bundling it all up and doing something useful, which is good. There's a really good relationship with the FBI. Uh, the, I got a, a contact from them some years ago where they're like, hey, it's the FBI when I talk about Have I Been Pwned. I was like, oh, crap, isn't going to be. No, no, that's fine. So, <laughs> we would like to give you passwords to put into Have I Been Pwned because they come across a lot of passwords during the, the course of their investigations. So they have a, a, a fire hose where they just feed passwords into the password search feature, nice. which is great. And that's ongoing, and there'll be a whole bunch of other stuff happening in the future with them. They've provided email addresses in the past from things like the Emotet botnet because they're sort of going, look, there's, a, there's just a bunch of people in this. We can't really just sort of start emailing randos and saying, hey, we're the FBI, you're in a, uh, yeah, you're, you're in a botnet. So, well, let's sort of the, the stuff we tell people to look out for because that sounds very fishy. So they've been good. The NCA in the UK, same thing, the National Crime Authority Agency over, uh, over there. So yeah. they've been feeding passwords in as well. They put a couple of hundred million in uh, in one of our recent releases. So, yeah, it's, it's look, it's just really, really cool to see the way, that, you know, when I started this and it's like I'm dealing with a lot of illegally obtained data. I hope all this is going to be all right. And now we're at a time where, governments and law enforcement and all the rest of it are, are not just feeding data in but using it really extensively either internally or through the community outreach things uh, and I'm, I'm just super stoked about that i think it's a really unexpected awesome outcome well you you've raised that risk level as well you're an independent uh person do you you must have a core network uh of associates that you sort of get advice from or do you find you do tend to work really independently and obviously there with your wife as well my wife and I talk a lot. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> That's a good thing, Troy. Um, you know, I, I I wouldn't say there's like advisors and I have a mentor or something like that, but there's every single day there's a lot of people who reach out and they ask questions or they make suggestions. Um, every day there's people that want to you know, invest or partner or things like that. So that there's loads and loads of discussions that I have, even you know, working remotely on the the wrong side of the world to most people uh, and of course not traveling for a bunch of time there yeah there's still a lot of opportunity to engage with people and and sort of get ideas and yeah the social media being what it is as well there's a lot of a lot of feedback through there so i feel that as much as you know on the one hand it's sort of me sitting here building this thing on my own on, on the other hand it's a uh, it's the the culmination of a lot of community contribution as well whether that be code in the case of the open source bits or just good ideas I think you do do that. Uh, I see regularly you do throw it out to the community or your own community if you've got a problem and it might even be your smart home uh, solutions. I followed you through that particular trail. Where are you at with your smart home? All done now or are you still adding I've, stuff I've got on? stuff all over the place here. Literally in front of me, I'm like printing brackets for the new <laughs> mailbox because I want to put a, a, a read switch on it so I know when it's open but it won't fit properly. So I'm up here last night mucking around with Fusion 360, trying to figure out how to print a bracket the right size. Uh, yeah. Now it's really good fun, honestly. Well, if you're down <laughs> to a read switch on the letterbox, I think you're all, <laughs> you really must be really uh, getting down to the end of that. And again, that's something, have you, have you categorized all of that uh, in terms of that journey? Uh, have you been able to box that all up in particular? Because it was very interesting 
in terms of the process that you went through? And I imagine there's some learnings out there for the general community as well. Yeah, well, it, it all began, as many of these things do, very simply, which is uh, all I wanted to do was to be able to open the garage door by talking yeah. to the lady on my watch whose name I can't mention, she'll start listening again. Uh, and, and that seemed pretty simple. And this was this was early 2020, so COVID had just hit, and it's like, all right, we're going to be home for a while. Let's figure out how to do I'll go online and I'll buy a device and it will be 100 bucks or something and I'll plug it in and it will be job done. And then I realised how hard it is just to do that. Yeah. So I ended up going down the home assistant path. So there's a there's a home automation system running on a Raspberry Pi, one of the world's largest, uh, most active open source uh, projects as well, uh, home assistant. And then it just kind of escalated from there. And I, I did write a, a five part blog series on IoT and home automation. You know, there's a bit in there about security and a bit on usability and all the rest of it. And I, I kind of feel that we're it's a little bit like the 3D printing I got into around the same time. It just feels like we're at the very very early stages of something which will be really, really impactful and significant in our lives in the longer term. And you know, we're, we're here just sort of failing and learning as we go. And it's look a great reminder of this. We've got renovations and things happening at the moment. You can probably hear nail guns in the background <laughs> right now. And I'm trying to get IoT door locks. And to find an IoT door lock that sort of ticks all the boxes is extraordinarily hard and now apple has just launched home key so it's literally on your watch and you just walk up and it's nfc and it's great and there are like three door locks that do it and all of them are terrible in one way or another so yeah well, i think likewise you're at the forefront of that it's always good uh to see someone else making mistakes or at least trying uh and then uh, going down the wrong path or actually making it work and again the conversations that you have uh, with your community in that process uh, is always interesting. So, you know, again, uh, kudos to you and and to keep it up. Um, now, we had a slight sort of lead into what you might be talking about in uh, Perth. Can you give a little bit more of an overview of what your keynote will, will cover without giving too much away? Well, here's my dirty secret for the, for the conference <laughs> talks I do. I normally give them a name which is specific enough to be interesting but generic enough that I can figure out what I actually want to talk about later on. So we've got, at the, as of the time of recording, we've got like, what, two months and two days or something. And I know that there's going to be a bunch of stuff happening between now and then. And if, if we think, particularly about Australia, like think back to how much stuff happened in the last part of last year between Optus and Medibank and all the other stuff around there. Uh, so who knows what's going to happen between now and then. There's a, there's a bunch of old goodies I, I often pull out and so long as it's going to be a different audience to what might have seen it before, I'll talk about those. But there will be new things between now and then. Uh, and, and, of course, when you're there in front of a, a live audience and you can actually see people and interact, there's a bunch of stuff you can do that's a bit harder uh, than remotely anyway. Well, it's great to see you back on the road and, and travelling. It's Cyber West Summits, the 10th to the 11th of May 2023 at the Pan Pacific Hotel, Perth. My Security Media are pleased to be media partners with this particular event. We'll have the the, uh, the website in the show notes, but it's cyberwaresummit.com.au. Uh, and Troy, I, I've probably got 100 other questions, but really we're going to be running over time. Uh, I can only uh, recommend the audience uh, to reach out to you at Troy Hunt on Twitter uh, and uh, your own websites. And otherwise, it's pawned. Have I been pawned? pawned? Uh, and I've got that up on the screen as well. So absolute pleasure to meet you, Troy, and uh, we'll see you in Perth. Uh, in May. Well done. Awesome. Thank you for having me.